Hey, everyone. Before we get into today's interview, just wanted to drop a little reminder to stay up to date with all the latest episodes of On The Margin. You can subscribe to the BlockWorks Macro YouTube. Just go up there, just click the little uh, subscribe button, or you can click the links at the top of this episode. It'll take you over to Apple, Spotify, whatever your preferred platform is. Just subscribe there. And if you could, leave a rating and review. Really appreciate it. All right, on with the show. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On The Margin. This is a special episode of On The Margin because today I am joined by the one and only Neil Howe, uh, who is the sort of godfather of generational theory and the author of The Fourth Turning uh, back in 1997, but also his most recent book, The Fourth Turning, is here. So, Neil, welcome back to the show. Great, Mike. I'm very pleased to be here, and um, I, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, me as well. So... I want to, I'm sure many folks will be familiar with your work, but the way that I would like to segment this conversation is for the folks on who are listening today that don't have a great grasp of the framework that you laid out back in uh, 1991 with Generations and 97 with um, uh, The Fourth Turning is like, what, let's, let's just get an overview of your work and this general theory that you laid out. And then I want to spend the second half of our conversation focused on your new piece of work, why you think The Fourth Turning has finally arrived. And kind of create a, a sort of series of guideposts for all of us who are living through this, what we can expect. So can we just start with kind of the original fourth turning work and however you want to take it, just give us the, the sort of overview and key components. Well, you're, you're right. Uh, this started back actually in the late 1980s uh, when I started working with Bill Strauss on um, Generations. Mm. Uh, and what a lot of people don't realize is that initially we had no intention of writing about rhythms or cycles of history. Uh, we were interested in generational change. Um, you know, we, you know, our own generation, uh, kind of coming of age in the late 60s and 70s, uh, was very aware of this huge gap, which was a big deal back then uh, between boomers coming of age and the uh, most of their parents who had come of age during World War II. And we're aware of this incredible difference between uh, how our generations were raised and, and what was our priorities. Uh, you know, our parents came of age uh, splashing ashore at, at uh, uh, Normandy uh, and uh, building battleships and founding families and boomers were, I don't know, they had Woodstock and they were keeping their, they, keeping their lives on hold. They were taking voyages to the interior. I mean, a completely different sense of themselves. And so it fascinated us and we wanted to know uh, in a period in the 1980s when generations really had faded from most people's uh, radar screen, what, how these generational uh, contrasts evolve, how they developed historically, we um, we look back and found that uh, what we really wanted to do was was write an entire history of America as a sequence of generational biographies. And to mm -hmm. our amazement, we discovered no one had done that before. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, and the way people normally tell history is that every year you tell the history of what everyone every age is doing. You know, so in 1851, everyone's doing this. In 1852, everyone's doing this. Uh, but, and usually you're talking about people in their late 50s or 60s. They're the political leader. You know what I mean? And and sort of, and you might do a history of childhood, but then it's, you know, 10-year-olds one year and then next year, 10-year-olds. But you're never following the same people over time, right? Right. So that important uh, continuity of biographical experience and how it intersects history. If you look at history uh, and and uh, if you look at, well, just think about history as time is on the x-axis and age is on the y-axis, right? If, if, if that's how you look at it, we all live a diagonal line, right? <laughs> Every year, one year, we get one year older, right? So, and a generation is a series of diagonal lines. And a single point in time is a vertical line through all of those different diagonals, each of them having completely different memories, histories. They're shaped completely differently and their attitudes, their behaviors, and their self-identity. Uh, some, some of them came of age in a war. The other were the children of that war and saw it completely differently, right? Um, and what we did is we went back and found historically Americans had always been aware of their generational membership. They had seen themselves very differently depending on when they came of age and when they, you know, when they assumed leadership. Um, we, we call this their age location in history is fundamental at forging how people see life. 
Uh, and then, of course, you know, 30 or 40 years later, they become leaders and then they shape history. So history shapes generations young. Mm. And then later on, as, as parents and leaders, we shape history, which in turn shapes young people. Um, and one, so the first thing that interested us, and this was at the foreground of generations, was how generations come in certain patterns. And that was our discovery that there was a pattern sequence of generations. If you look at a generation like boomers, you know, protesting against authority, indulgently raised at in in an era of plenty, post-war era of plenty, rebelling against these strict institutions of their parents, wanting a greater degree of freedom and individualism, um, and then followed by a generation, which we got to know uh, in the 1990s, uh, Xers, uh, much more pragmatic, cynical, um, not really into so much uh, uh, that kind of utopianism or idealism, uh, much more bottom line oriented. This sequence, um, this sequence, Mike, has happened repeatedly in American history. This is part of a pattern. And in fact, after the um, after the the Gilded Generation or the Exer Generation, we typically have a moral panic over children. And suddenly we start raising a more protected generation, right? Uh, special, coddled, uh, you know, they're uh, much more structured upbringing and, and much more into teamwork, you know, much more into trusting others. And of course, we're all familiar with the generation X being followed by millennials, right? Who came along in the early uh, 1980s. Suddenly there are babies on board and five different ways of buckling your child into the into the minivan and, and these cuddly, cuddly baby movies, right? And, and a very different generational persona emerged from that with political consequences, I might add. If you look at how people vote now that these generations are growing older, that was what interested us, right? Now, what we tied that to is a very interesting fact that historians have learned about American history, and that is uh, that large periods, very important fundamental cornerstone periods of civic reconstruction in American history, where we rebuild the outer world of economics and politics and infrastructure occur about once every uh, long human lifetime, right? So we had our period of, of basically total war and rebellion and revolution during the colonial period in the last quarter of the 17th century, you know, the glorious revolution, Bacon's rebellion and all that. And then about a lifetime later, we had the American Revolution. Then a lifetime later, we had the Civil War, then the New Deal and World War II. And then here we are today, right? Mm. That's the fourth turning, by the way, which I'll get to in a second. And then roughly halfway in between those, we have the great inner world reconstruction eras, mm. where we reconstruct the inner world of values, religion, culture, the arts, and that those are the great awakenings of American history. Very conveniently, we actually number them. We talk about the first great awakening, the second great. <laughs> so you can actually number them. And many historians talk about the late 60s and 1970s as America's fourth or fifth great awakening, depending on when you want to start your count with, with uh, John Winthrop in the 17th century or Jonathan Edwards in the 18th century. So you can kind of see here how this all begins to come into shape. Some generations are born uh, during a crisis uh, as children. In other words, they grew up as children during a crisis. Some generations are born just after a crisis, like boomers, for example, right? Born just after World War II. Some generations grow up as children during an awakening, like Xers. These were the throwaway kids, right? When was, everyone is, you know, the, the Xers are the, the kids people took pills not to have. You know, they kind of grew up in this period of, of, um, of uh, awakening when everyone is sort of shedding social obligation. And that was their childhood experience. And then right after the awakening, we had millennials coming along. So you can see how this begins to sort of fall into a pattern. Now, looking at history that way, which was much more the emphasis of our second book, The Fourth Turning, which came out in 1997, is really starting with social moods, which correspond to each of these generational eras, and we call them first turning, second turning, third turning, and fourth turning. And looking at generational aging and the generational experience as the motive force of the dynamic behind it. So the way you see this whole thing is, 
a long cycle of about a long human lifetime divided up into 20 to 25 year segments, right? Each one a generation long, each one corresponding to a new generation coming of age, a new generation coming into childhood. And the way you look at it is the first turning is what we call the high. This is a period like the late 40s, 1950s, early 60s, presidencies of Truman and Eisenhower and John Kennedy, a period when institutions are strong, individualism is weak. Uh, the country feels like it's more than the sum of its parts. We're personally modest about ourselves as individuals, but we feel we're part of a great organization that can really function well and actually change the world. Uh, that's followed by, that's the spring season. The summer season would be the second turning. That's the awakening where we throw off all these uh, obligations. Mm -hmm. we, we, we transform ourselves into a much more individualistic society spearheaded as usual by the rising generation. That would be boomers in this case. We call that the profit archetype, by the way. And then the third turning is the fall season. And this would be uh, most recently the late 1980s, 1990s, early 00s, right? And that's when Xers are coming of age. Boomers are moving into midlife. Uh, institutions are weak. Individualism is strong. And I think we all have that experience of going into bookstores and every, every, uh, every, every, every upbeat book you see is about me, myself, and I. You know, I can do anything. I can conquer the world. And every downbeat book is about what we collectively share. It's like the end of family, the end of politics, the end of community. You ever notice that? That, that really is the period we've been living through. Um, I, I always think the 1990s, the, the light motif was really Francis Fukuyama, the end of history, right? Uh, markets and individualism around the world would triumph, the governments would fade away, and we would just contract with each other. And then finally, the fourth turning, which is the winter season, where we reconstruct institutions and institutional power um, uh, in a very different, sort of the opposite of the awakening, right? So the awakening, we think institutions are too powerful, particularly the rising generation in a fourth turning. We think institutions are too weak, uh, particularly the rising generation. I think absolutely true today with millennials. Uh, they think institutions are too weak. They need to be strengthened. And, and we can talk about that if you want. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On The Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of BlockWorks Research. Now, many of you will probably for, be familiar with our platform, but BlockWorks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no-brainer. As a listener of On The Margin, and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount, and that gives you access to everything, which would be weekly in-depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So again, that's code MARGIN10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. I do. Yeah, that was a really helpful overview. And part of what I, I really just love about your the way that you frame this is, you know, two things, which is I, one of the ideas that I always come back to when I think about your, your work is just this very simple idea of generational forgetting, which is you can go back, there are various historians over the centuries have sort of noted this idea of, you know, there's sort of a, a connection in between your work with generational theory and this old saying that many people have heard, which is that uh, bad times make for hard men, hard make, men make for good times, good men make for for weak times and uh, you know weak times make for for bad men sort of sort of thing and there's this idea that you know after every crisis it takes about a full human life cycle right for people just not to remember that and then there's also this very understandable very logical idea that we all understand which is rebelling against our parents right and our parents ideals and wanting to do our own thing and the idea that that can play out in a somewhat predictable way over grand spans of human history I just find so elegant and beautiful to encapsulate in, in one single theory. And the other thing that I really love about it is I always find it very interesting when you approach this from somewhat of a sociological sort of standpoint, a studying of civic dynamics and intergenerational relationships and conflict. But your theory actually dovetails pretty nicely with sort of the Ray Dalio theory of uh, short and long-term debt cycles, where there are also these 
shorter term cycles in terms of financials, but also these longer 80 or 90 year cycles. And what's so interesting about that is that both of you come at it from a different set of logic and and perspective, but you've arrived at a very similar result and described somewhat of a similar process. I mean, what similarities do you see in between the sociological and civic observations that you've made and maybe translating that into some of the broader market theories of of cycles that you know we've talked about on the show? What I try to do is is bring them all together and give them a common governor. You know what I mean? Sort of a common timetable or a common um, wellspring, right? A common, in other words, the, this, this generational dynamic, one of the things about generations and the lifespan is it has a periodicity in it. It's called human aging, right? We have, we have phases of life that come at us and each generation is ultimately mortal. It dies out, right? And this actually gives the timing to the cycle. One, one problem people have with long-term cycles is why would it have any timing, right? In other words, some long-term, you know, infrastructure cycle or R&D cycle or whatever, you know, K-Wave is a good example, right? What gives it its any periodicity? Well, it's the human life cycle that gives it its periodicity. You see what I mean? And 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 this we, we talk about uh, starting with the K-Wave. You know, Nikolai Kondratiev was a tragic figure. Uh, he was a, um, uh, he, had, he had the misfortune to discover a cyclic, long-term cyclical dynamics of, of capitalism when, he, when it was first beginning to be recognized. It had, you know, two, two and a half cycles, you know, since, since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, but he was, uh, you know, no one believed in cycles who was a true Marxist-Leninist and, and Stalin had him shipped out to a gulag where he died, right? But his theories, uh, the broad family of K-wave theories, have become very popular. And I think basically uh, in sort of a, a, a two-cycle format, if you think of a one of these cycles is sort of 45 to 50 years long, is basically sort of a, you know, AB, AB on, <laughs> in other words, um, uh, first turning being buoyant, the awakening typically is not a buoyant period, like the 1970s in America. The third turning being buoyant, the fourth turning again, secular down, downturn. But many other uh, cycles we look at, uh, one of the most impressive is the cycle of realigning elections in America, uh, because all of our realigning elections where we fundamentally redefine political parties have all occurred in crises or awakenings. In fact, every awakening, every crisis has a has a big period of realignment. And interestingly enough, uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, many m- many political uh, political scientists are talking about America's um, uh, sixth or seventh realignment now with the Trump election, right? And what we're now seeing with the realignment of, of politics, particularly around uh, issues of education, where you really can see how, you know, lower income and less demo- less educated Democrats who used to vote for Obama or, or even Clinton are now migrating the Republican Party and more educated suburban people are vote are, you know, migrating uh, uh, the other way. This, this uh, uh, populist transformation of the, of the Republican Party and sort of an inverse transformation of Democrats is coming to be regarded now, um, uh, you know, with how many elections, twenty, particularly 2016, 2018, 2020, and 2022. We'll see what happens in 2024. I have no doubt that it's going to be any different. You, you really see a kind of a very different alignment of American demographic groups. And so I think we see that again. Uh, fertility. Um, uh, immigration is also strongly associated with the cycle, which lends a kind of a demographic push to what we see attitudes toward family, um, uh, uh, crime, uh, drug abuse, uh, you name it. Uh, people have looked at long-term cycles, which broadly go along with, uh, which are broadly in sync with what, with what we're talking about. Um, and I, I think that, lands a sort of interdisciplinary quality to what we do. You know, you can sort of look, uh, because we're talking about social moods, but there's many different ways to see a social mood. Um, I, I would say that the social scientist who, at a very basic level, is very much in sync with what um, we talk about is uh, Robert Putnam, probably the best known 
sociologist in America who wrote the famous book called The Bowling Alone, right? Why do Americans do things alone that we used to do in groups? You know, we used to go bowling with the Elks Club or, you know, we used to go with the Rotary Club. And today we all go bowling alone. And his, he, he, he confirms with all of his data analysis, it was largely generationally driven. It wasn't something just along, everyone started changing their behavior at every age. He said that people born, you know, from uh, the early, you know, around 1900 up to about 1940, what we, we'd call the GI and silent generation, were accustomed even in their youth to doing things in groups. And then starting with boomers and extending through Xers, increasingly accustomed to doing things as individuals and doing it at every age, meaning, you know, they did it when they were, you know, even at age 10, they did it much more than the older people. And what's really changed in American society is the older people never changed. They just aged out. And all these younger people who were raised from early age to do things as individuals have simply replaced them at every age bracket. So it's genuinely a generational replacement trend. And he says this is not a one-time, this is not a unidirectional trend. This is a um, a cycle. This is a very long-term cycle. He expects it to be replaced with a new cycle toward um, greater peer orientation and greater community in time. So he has been looking at that. And, and in his most recent edition of, of Bowling Alone, you can see some of his notes on this trend. So that that idea of individualism, I really like how you've traced that throughout the even the last hundred years in America. And I feel like individualism is kind of a cornerstone of how Americans define themselves today, especially compared to some of our Eastern counterparts. One, one other idea, Neil, that I think you, you cover extremely well, and it's probably more relevant to the third and fourth turnings part of this cycle, is this idea of institutions and kind of uh, crumbling and then eventually rebuilding, you know, even more strongly institutions at the end of a fourth turning. So it's a it's a trend that I think many people in America will just be aware of today. It's something that we've talked about on the show many, many times before. But this constant theme, I think all roads sort of lead back to this lack of trust in institutions across all walks of life, right? That could be healthcare post-COVID, that could be fake news, media, we talk about it a lot within the context of financial institutions like central banks. But can you just define, maybe this is the part where we can get into the third and fourth turning and start to look forward a little bit. But can you talk about the way that uh, the role that institutions play in this cycle, especially nearer towards the end of the sort of third and fourth turning when they're crumbling? So that really is the challenge of the fourth turning is to reinvent and recreate strong institutions that work. Uh, You all know how low uh, America's trust is in institutions and the bigger and more national and, 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 and uh, 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 more overarching the institution and organizing our, our social life, the more we distrust it, you know, Congress, the presidency, the big media, so on. Uh, Interestingly, you go down to more sort of local stuff like your local neighborhood, your family, uh, we see plenty of satisfaction, right? Uh, and that's actually interesting. And it's, it's, a, it's a trend we notice in fourth turnings that in the search for community, in the quest to escape loneliness and isolation uh, and uh, alienation, uh, which again is a quest that's strongest among the rising generation during a fourth turning. Um, we see that today among millennials, right? FOMO being the biggest fear. You don't want to miss out. You want to be connected, right? You, 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 you want to be on a social media uh, platform where everyone can see you in real time and check you out. And, you know, you can, you can always have feedback on how you're behaving and whether or not you're fitting in, right? So important for the rising generation. At, at the same age when boomers wanted to, you know, tune in, turn out and drop out, you know, get out of the net, you know, actually go off into their own commune, you know, get away from people, get away from, right, all of that, not to join in. Um, and and again, I, I want to emphasize that because we talked earlier about how millennials are an order seeking generation, whereas boomers are an order avoiding generation. And that is, 
One of the biggest complaints that boomers had was after this period of increasing um, um, decline in inequality, right? Uh, 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 wages were becoming more equal. Wealth was becoming more equal. A little bit during the 1930s, hugely during the 40s and 50s, and even more, you know, into the 1960s. So that by the late 60s, the American middle class was very, very powerful. And if there's one thing boomers hated, it was the middle class because it was suburbia everywhere. It was um, Pleasant Valley Sunday, charcoal burning everywhere. That was their biggest nightmare. And they wanted to get away from the middle class. They all wanted to be. Could we all just be deviants, different strokes for different folks? We go in different directions. Why do we all have to fit in? But you ask millennials, it's it's exactly reversed. If I talk to millennials today about middle class, th their questions are, where is it? Sounds great. Where do I sign up? I just don't see it anywhere, right? Man, I so and, feel like that. As a millennial, I completely <laughs> agree with that. But But this is my point, is that you're looking for something that's gravitational. Whereas millennia, boomers wanted to explode what was gravitational. And still today, you find uh, boomers, you know, railing against suburbia, you know, and, and railing against group living. Um, so so this, is what has, this is what has changed. Now, in the process, uh, when you have a completely individuated society, in the process of, it, it doesn't happen effortlessly, however, right? If everyone's all used to their individualism, what happens is they start gathering in groups. It's kind of like um, uh, it's kind of nebulae forming from stars, right? <laughs> they all sort of gather gather in different. They they gravitate into different groups, and ultimately they get they gravitate into two groups, right? Because any third group needs to join a stronger partner, and and this is what we see, and we see two versions of it today. One is geopolitical, one is internal to the United States. And one is this enormous division, and we see this, by the way, in every fourth turning, between two huge polarized groups of Americans. Today, we call it blue zone versus red zone. But back in the 1930s, it was, it was fascist versus communist. And in fact, if, if you would talk to anyone on the, the, the popular front left in the 1930s, you know, they called the 1930s the fascist decade. And of course, any Republican called it the red decade. But it was the same division in America. And you look at what happened in uh, obviously the 1850s, setting up to the Civil War, it was, uh, you know, Southerns versus Northern abolitionists. And it sent the same gravitational forces occurring. If obviously Whigs against Tories, you know, back in the, the 1760s, 1770s. But, but, and again, so this is common, this, this gravitating into two polarized groups. And the same thing is going on geopolitically, right? New contenders, an old order, an old concert of nations that seems exhausted, sclerotic, dysfunctional, with new upstarts, right? Wanting to challenge the order. And it's in the fourth turning that uh, through a process that usually includes organized conflict, uh, one side wins and another side loses, you know, quite frankly. And, and looking at how that process plays out, particularly how it can go on a knife edge between internal versus external conflict, the, the 1930s and early 40s is a great example of that, because if you had gone into America back in, say, 1937, and it asked a typical American, it just told them, there's going to be a big conflict in a few years. <laughs> What's it going to be about? It probably would have said, I guess it would have been, you know, FDR against uh, the Republicans. It would have been fascism against communism or something like that, because, of course, no one believed that liberal democracy had any future back then, right? We were mm. still admired in the Great Depression. We saw fascist dictatorships uh, taking over in much of Europe. People were looking at the Soviet Union as the, as the, as the wave of the future. Um, and many of the best and brightest um, of the greatest generation, the young people at that time, the, the, we, we later called them the GI generation, obviously, for what they later went through, but many of them were joining the Communist Party. I mean, many of them were socialists. Many of them, yeah, followed orders from the Comintern, right? Moscow. 
to actually put an end to uh, capitalism in America. And we forget today we call them the greatest generation. We look back upon them as, you know, mom and apple pie and they always believe. But, but back in 1937, they were still signing Oxford pledges in Yale Stadium or Stanford Stadium, vowing that if America declared war, they would not serve, right? That was a horrible nightmare of World War I. So how did that change, right? How did that change? How did this huge awareness of internal conflict in America, which is still so strong in the late 1930s, um, and I just remind people that even in the spring of 1940, we were still in the Great Depression. That's when long-term bonds hit its low point, not until... Not until the spring of 1940, we were still had deflation. We still had double-digit unemployment. Uh, and all, nearly all Americans said, even despite years and years of New Deal programs, we were still in the Great Depression. I turned that around into suddenly a very different right kind of conflict between us versus them. That is a fascinating story. And actually... Uh, Looking, looking at this historically and looking how that happens during the American Revolution, during the American Civil War, and, and so on, and earlier fourth turnings is actually part of the story I tell in the book uh, because it has important implications for how we look into the future today. But one thing is clear is that by the end of this period, by the end of this fourth turning, which we expect to end sometime in the early 2030s, um, we will have under dint of national, you know, public mobilization, a sense of national urgency. Um, and, and probably just looking at the historical record conflict, we will come out with greatly strengthened uh, national institutional life. Indeed, we will come out with, if, if our fourth turning this is like any of our earlier fourth turning, with a completely new rejuvenated sense of what the American public represents and a huge new commitment by Americans to that republic, you know, and to 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 the nation and the republic for which it stands, and you know, all all of the stuff that goes along with this. This has happened every time. And why is it? And this is a question we can explore. Why is it that our nation does its most fundamental reconstruction of its civic institutions at these periods of crises, right? At these periods, when the near-term future seems so in doubt, is exactly when we reconstruct our long-term institutions, right, for how we're going to function into the future. That's actually one of the great paradoxes I point out. If you ask most people, you know, if 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 there's a what what's the best time for us to actually reconfigure all of our institutions so they work again? You know what I mean? Because everyone's dissatisfied. No one believes the federal government works anymore. Most of it's you know, the Congress hardly does anything anymore. You have a president trying to do things or executive order and complete dysfunction in this country, right? But if you ask most Americans, when should we really can reconfigure the whole system? Most of them would say, oh, at a time of peace and prosperity. You know, when we've got surpluses, there's not a recession on the right. Then we could do it. Then we could plan it right. Here's the thing. It never happens that way in history. Hey, everyone. We'll get back to the show in a minute, but just wanted to let you know that we've got our permissionless conference coming up. This is the one that we do with Bankless. It is the biggest and best conference in DeFi. It's going to be in Austin, Texas this year, September 11th through the 13th. Now, you've heard me say this many times on our show before, but the time to be bearish on crypto was 18 months ago when the Fed began raising rates. Since then, our entire market is down more than 50%. We've had all this bad news. In the last two weeks, we had BlackRock and a whole slew of other institutional invest investors file for a Bitcoin ETF. This space is not going anywhere. So if you're interested in investing in this space at all, I highly recommend that you attend this conference. The other thing, and I've said this before as well, brand market conferences are the best ones. The fall market, you have all this retail, all this noise. Now you only have the people that are really here building great products. This one is worth your time 100%. And since you are such good listeners to On Margin, which I really appreciate, giving you all a special 30% discount code. It is margin30. Now you can access that by clicking the link in the bottom of the show notes. So you can see my fingers pointing down, click that link. Because you are a listener of On The Margin, you get 30% off to the conference. Again, the code is margin30. We'll see y'all there. Not how it works. Not how it works. You know what? I've actually, I heard you describe this before, Neil, and I'm glad you brought this up because uh, that I don't think happens on a 
macro structure, but even on a micro structure. And I think the logical reason to belie that point is when things are good, why would you want to fix something that isn't broken? But when things already aren't working, it's a great excuse. It's almost a cloud it cover to change it all because exactly. something's clearly not broken here. So we might as well take the risk to just change exactly. it. So I want to, you're really getting at for me, the crux of the question here, the us versus them that tends to herald in the conflict that fourth turnings are associated with. And maybe it's the reds versus the blues and there's an internal sense of conflict. But the other conflict that I feel has a really strong gravitational force, it's sort of the super massive black hole that sits at the galaxy of politics today. It's the great power competition of the United States versus China. And to use your exact example back in the, the 30s, right, there was there were the fascists and there were the communists. And many people forget, speaking of those who have seen Oppenheimer, you know, there was a very strong presence of communists in the United States. There were a lot of sympathizers of the Soviets and it complicated our relationships among the allied nations. But what that transformed into was an inter like a uh, international conflict that solved the internal conflict within the US. And come on, I just can't help but look at the comparison between what's going on in the US and China today. So do you agree with that comparison? And how do you see it playing out? Every for turning has both an internal and external potential conflict. And that the question of what will be dominant is hard to say. Indeed, they can occur simultaneously. Um, what typically happens during a civil war, and we have plenty of instances to point that out, is one side or the other invites in a foreign ally, right? I mean, think about it, you know, if, if particularly if you're on the losing side, right? If you look like you're losing, you're going to invite in some foreign ally. What did we do in the American Revolution? We invited in the French. We, we wouldn't have won without the French. I mean, I'll just tell you honestly, after the Battle of Saratoga, we had a treaty with the French and they came over their, their, their army and their, their navy, particularly their, their, their navy, uh, you know, Admiral de Grasse, and he came in and he blockaded the, the British and, and we defeat them at Yorktown. And, but, but more broadly, the, 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 the Navy, uh, uh, the, the French opened up an entire new world war for Britain and really forced Britain to stop uh, the, uh, any attempt to, uh, to counter the revolution by the end of uh, 1781 after Yorktown. And it was really the French presence of a new global war with Britain that we don't like to admit it, but what was much more important to Britain <laughs> was the sugar islands of the West Indies. There was a lot more revenue from sugar than there was from the colonies. Uh, I hate to say it, but it's true. But they were really interested in making sure the French didn't take that. They didn't take various uh, other areas in, in Africa and India and so on. But, but here's my point. It was both a world war and a civil war at the same time. The American Revolution was a civil war. I mean, most of the Tories and the and the and the loyalists who were killing each other were American. Um, so it was a civil war, but it had very strong external dimensions. Obviously, there was the Patriots against uh, uh, against King George and against the Parliament, and also the the French were brought in with it. The South did everything they could to bring in Britain. And France on their side. Uh, I think uh, uh, Robert E. Lee was one major battlefield victory away from bringing in the French or the uh, British. Um, uh, if he had won the Battle of Antietam rather than lost it, instead, Lincoln won it and declared the next week uh, the Emancipation Proclamation that completely changed the nature of the war for the European powers. And they really could not support the Confederacy after that. That was kind of a very very deft move by Lincoln at that point. Um, and you can go back again in, in earlier episodes. And, and so there, there always is an internal dimension even to an external conflict. And typically um, uh, an internal party that does not favor the conflict quite as much as the other is often blackballed after the crisis. I mean, and particularly if you're on the losing side of a civil war, well, you're in the political wilderness throughout the entire saculum. Look what happened in the Democratic Party after the Civil War. I mean, they had two presidencies, right? Grover Cleveland and Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> and that was it until uh, the Great Depression. But right. my point is, is that uh, same thing would happen the Democratic coalition. They had a, they had a bunch of presidents, uh, but they dominated Congress all the way up until the early 1990s, right? 
so so this is very important. It sets the stage. The first turning tends to be the the late third turning, the late fourth turning, and the first turning tends to be a one party government, and that's yeah. why everything works so well. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but you know, you got a dominant party, and the other party is sort of a it's a sun and the moon situation. The other party just tries to you know make suggestions and get little things done, sort of on the on the outskirts and 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 tries to get what leverage they can. But this is when uh, the country does does big things, right? Invests hugely in infrastructure, kind of uh, uh, reconfigures America's institutions in a big way. So, so this whole process is is fascinating to me, particularly the process of conflict. Uh, there's a, I think it's chapter eight. I talk a lot about the psychology and sociology of conflict, and the irony is, of course, is that where do we actually gather? this new generational experience of extreme teamwork, of extreme collectivity, of being bonded, right, to your peers, we get it, I hate to say it, but you get it in conflict. And so that's why we we go through this process again and again. I have a, a wonderful thing, and by the way, I just might mention here because it's a, a famous speech by William James. He knew a lot about psychology and knew a lot about the psychology mm. of conflict. And almost everyone knows the, the title of the speech. He delivered it at Stanford in 1906, and it's called The Moral Equivalent of War. And he starts out the speech by saying, we all understand how war is almost essential for the extreme degree of social organization, which makes every state work on earth today, right? I mean, it's how people learn to put aside their own personal interests for the sake of the common will. We learn to deal with adversity. We learn to develop effective organizations and lose sight of our own individual, you know, monetary interest or whatever. We do things for the good of the community. And anyway, he's rhapsodic about all these things. And then he says, but could we do this without war? And now, now he's not talking about is war necessary in terms of is it, is it worth the cost or is it morally? He's, he's talking about it as a social experience. Without war, how do we, how do we become a single community, Right. And he says, maybe we could do without war. He doesn't sound terribly convincing. I think if you read the speech, I'm not sure he, he's convinced himself. But at one point in the speech, he, he has something very interesting. This is 1906. And he said, if I were to ask all of you in the audience, when, and he said, there's a paradox. He said, if I were to ask all of you in the audience, what it would have been better if the United States had not been in the Civil War, if the Civil War it never would have happened. He said, I'm sure almost... Almost all of you would say, uh, no, it would not have been better. It's good that the Civil War happened. It's kind of astonishing, you know, uh, listening to this. And he said, because no one in the audience could imagine the sense of progress America has today, right? Industrialization, the unity of our nation. I mean, he goes down through all the things that came out of the Civil War, right? And he said, I think we, we could hardly imagine, right? And then he says, but if I asked you, would, would you like something like this happening again in the near future? <laughs> I think almost Absolutely all of you would not. say no. You know what I mean? But he said, that's a paradox, isn't it? That we always think it's good that we go through these events. A lot like Americans say, well, World War II was the good war. You know, I mean, we, we learned to build all these big things together, right? We came together as a nation. But if you want to do it again, no, almost always says, no, I don't want to do it again. But I think it's, it's something very similar to people in their personal lives. I mean, if I were to, if I were to ask you, um, if I were to ask you, Mike, well, imagine and we have all that experiences like that. You know, our family fell apart, had a divorce, our Break business up. failed, yeah. it didn't yeah. make, you know, whatever it is, right? Would you have rather that it never happened? And most people on reflection will say, no, actually, no. You know, it actually it came out a stronger person. I explored places and I discovered powers about myself that I never would have known had I not been through that, right? But of course, if you ask people, well, do you want to happen again to you next year? I think almost all of them say, well, no, actually not. But but so it remains a paradox at the individual level, no less than at the collective level, right? And I think that says something very important about the fourth turning as a as a complex system. There are a lot of complex systems which need these eras of Radical and even painful transformation. You know, uh, this is familiar to anyone who works in, in the environmental movement, right? 
forests need fires. I mean, a, a lot of sequoias won't germinate, you know, in, unless the seeds reach a certain temperature, right? So literally forests need fires to, to regenerate. Um, uh, rivers need floods. I mean, you can go down a lot of examples in the natural world. And, and I think that it is, a, it is a characteristic of modern societies with these big leviathons that we call governments or states which govern them that need these periods of rapid transformation um, uh, uh, and um, critic, criticality, right, uh, with, with, the, with the urgent threat of national survival for these institutions to rejuvenate themselves and tip the playing field once again to, to, to the young and, and to the future, as opposed to what it is now is, is all tipped to the old and, and to the past. Um, and, and also to, um, to ensure a new sense of equality, a new sense of social equality, which the rising generation can then enjoy once again. Yeah. You know what, Neil, I think that's a really actually a perfect place to just end it with actually a note of optimism there, because despite the fact that no one wants to go through conflict and look, I'm not going to get on this podcast and say, I, I would hope for an outcome like World War II again. I think most people upon reflection, I, I love the analogy to your personal life and just think about, you know, experiences that felt particularly trying or difficult or stressful or push you out of your comfort zone at the time, you know, sort of what, what came next. And I, I just, again, at the, want to be perfectly clear, I'm not advocating for a scenario no. or something like that, but you can clearly see where conflict belongs in the generational sort of turnings here. And Neil, you also, I, I want to give you a sense because you've, you've inspired so many people with your work um, and really, I think, formalized a, a sort of deep sense of truths that I think a lot of people have sensed. And you just recently wrote your book. I'll give you a little uh, shill here. And it's been at the top of the New York Times bestseller for the last uh, three weeks. And I'm sure probably folks will n but just give, give folks the best way if they want to find out more about your work or take a look at the book. What's the best way to, to do that? Well, the, the, you know, the, the book you can buy anywhere. I uh, uh, you know, Kindle or hard copy or whatever. Uh, the the audio version I actually did myself. So uh, ah, it's uh, it's yeah, that was a long haul in the studio, but uh, it is by <laughs> by yours truly. Um, and uh, and if you want to follow my work, we're actually starting. Um, uh, I my my day job is with with Hedge Eye Risk Management. I'm head of demography there, but we're starting a Substack in the in late. Uh, uh, late this month, late August. And, uh, but to learn all about that, you can just go on to fourthturning.com. So one-stop shop and you can look, you know, look at all the books, look at any other contacts you want to get. So. Excellent. And we will drop that link in the show notes, guys. I highly recommend that you check it out. Neil, it's always a pleasure when we get to speak and uh, congratulations on the new book and uh, congratulations on laying out a framework, which I think has largely already been proven Correct, but it uh, certainly seems even more prescient than when you originally wrote this back in back in the '90s. So, uh, congratulations again, and you know, wish the book continued success. Great, thank thank you so much for having me on. This was this was great. I appreciate it. Thanks, Neil.